Okay. Wow, <laughs> Eric. <laughs> but not working. He spent <laughs> silently. <laughs> <laughs> My knee right now over there. <laughs> Nobody saw that, right? Craig, you didn't see anything. <laughs> I didn't see anything. I need to change. Uh, <laughs> I got to change. Uh, who's got the uh, faux fur pillow there with the uh, baseball cap on? <laughs> That's got to be Zach. Me. Zach yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Thanks. It's his bear pillow. Maybe. Yeah, it looks comfy. Uh, it's something. Zach, Zach will make Zach. We'll, we'll make him get on the guitar. He's a quite the uh, quite the musician. I'm okay with that. We'll make you. We'll let you play a little thing at the end. Okay. Uh, like I keep telling everybody, we're gonna when everybody gets in here, we're gonna mute everybody and then start pulling people off. So enjoy your unmuted freedom for now. Yeah, suckers. <laughs> uh, coach, it goes for you too. Oh, yeah, I know, yeah, but yeah. okay. I might just go ahead and do you. Yeah, Jacob. <laughs> Where's Megan? Doing work. She's probably working. actually doing something important. She's probably probably <laughs> probably emailing me about something I haven't <laughs> given her yet. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I'm actually going to go through here and make all our speakers co hosts because then you'll be at the top of my list. Oh, come Right? Okay. <laughs> Eric. Yeah. <laughs> Won't even let me. I can't even see me now. Craig's mustache is just taking over. <laughs> Jeez, you are a mess. I don't even know how to how to do that. One, two, three, three four yeah. of you guys and Milner. Right here. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to find. Make right sure you're here, buddy. <laughs> Just what you need, Dave? Hey, um, oh, I forgot you guys know each other. Those intros I sent you, do you want me to just? Well, yeah, how do you think you got here? Ask some questions. <laughs> hey, y'all quiet down just for a second. What'd you say, Dave? Do you want me to like introduce each runner? Like I like I sent you those intros. Do you want yeah, me to yeah. say, all right, so here on this call, we have Lauren and then and then do her bio and then Eric and then and yeah. Craig in the bio. And uh, they, can, they can chat and say whatever they'd like if they want to. Um, okay say something embarrassing about the other co-host and becomes a, becomes a, uh, what is it? Uh, a roast. That's what really this is. This is a roast. It might turn into that. There's a good chance. To be perfectly honest, Dave, this is a, this is an intervention. We're all friends here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, very, it's a very elaborate scheme. Yeah. Ashton Keecher will jump out here in a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. So, how's everyone's day? I'm doing AP's taxes. <laughs> I, hopefully, he saved up money because I 1099 the hell out of him. <laughs> Wait, it's like April 8th today? Mm, yeah. It's getting, yeah, yeah, it's getting close. Well, I, everything everything's delayed this year, but. Oh, yeah. Ain't yeah. hey, nobody paying so. taxes this year. <laughs> I like this Trey Whitten guy. He put your face up as his profile. <laughs> and he has the best questions. So uh, oh my God. Trey, uh, <laughs> Trey, Trey's a character. So far. He's a character. I don't have uh, I don't have boring. My kids aren't boring. There's something. Hilarious. Be careful what you say about Trey. He finds out where you live. He's already been texting me. Oh, I'm sure. Telling me to shut up, so. Yeah, he'll, he's a bully. Not just true. Is that you? <laughs> he looks so cute. Who is that? That's Jacob. Which one? Right. 
The red-headed one? <laughs> no, the, whatever that picture is. But... Oh, God, that is terrible. It's so cute. You're so Oh, my cute. gosh, Trey. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw that. What did I do? Oh, gosh. What have you not done? Wait, what, did, what happened on mine? Uh, you haven't done anything yet. Oh. Oh, someone said, someone said, oh my God. I, I was looking for photos for the background. I'm like, oh God, I hope I didn't click on a bad one. <laughs> no, Trey's putting up pictures of Nick and Jacob. When <laughs> have, you, have you found one of me? No. It's not hard to follow on me. How many people? No, Trey, I do know where you live, so be very careful if you post anything of me. Where's Lydia? at where's who lydia oh i don't know not, oh, it's everybody, only not, not everybody's on here yet yeah. oh, people people will be probably coming in and out we've got about 35 in here right now yeah it's a lot of heathens <laughs> a lot of heathens yeah. Well, like uh, Max invited his group and Rachel Randall had some of hers and obviously I've got mine. This kind of uh, evolved. <laughs> I'm, yeah. Can you see how many people are on the Facebook Live? Uh, the feed has not gone up yet. It starts yeah. in five minutes. Okay. And it's got a 10 minute. It's got a, it's got a, well, no, it's got a 20 second delay in it. So. Okay. I'm kind of monitoring that. I it on my Instagram, the stories. Mm -hmm. So maybe yeah. some people will tune in to that too. Yeah, Facebook we'll see. Live, but um, I'm also going. Yeah. I'm also going to record it and then um, I'll give it to you guys if y'all want to do anything with it. I don't know. Just kind of fun to have. We're, we're trying to be semi organized. We'll see how it turns out. Okay, so we starting right at three yeah. on the dot. Uh, yeah, we got about four minutes. Okay, so get your voice ready. I'll 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 do a, I'll do a little intro and then I'll let you take it from there and then I'll start. Uh, I guess I'm a producer of sorts at this point. Look how professional I'm being. This is. Is that vodka? Yeah. Who knows? I told my parents to, 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 to watch the stream, <laughs> to watch the stream and don't be in the meeting. So we'll see. Yeah. I'm sure I'll get some complaints. I didn't tell my parents because when I had that Instagram live with my at, for NAZ with Alice, they were trying, my mom couldn't figure it out. And I was glad because she was going to start asking questions about like, what happens if you have to poop on the run? And it was like all these people, I was like, really? <laughs> you have to like, <laughs> <That's hilarious. laughs> seriously, <laughs> you do what you got to do. That's what you do. You do what you gotta do. Nice seeing Flagstaff. No one sees anything here. <laughs> Very oh, secluded. Man. Memphis, on the other hand, everybody. No, oh, this is like nowhere to hide <laughs> unless you're in Shelby Forest. No, there's nowhere to hide. Everything's publicized in Memphis. <laughs> well, you Nashville people do an experiment, mention Memphis and see what kind of response you get. Are you guys beating us now by population or are we, are you still slightly ahead? Well, define population. On the well, I guess like greater <laughs> than Houston. The problem with Nashville is I got like three counties that intersect. Well, they're, I think Nashville's numbers are higher just because there's more testing going on here. Um, I don't know if we're being better at social distancing or not. Probably not. <laughs> All right, got about two <laughs> minutes. People on the Greenway today, you know. Okay. At three o'clock, I'll mute everybody and then I'll unmute the co-host and then we'll kind of go from there. <clears throat> and then people trickling in will just be <laughs> probably just unmuted. Okay. Unmuted. Cool. We'll see how this goes. I'm interested. Be great. See if this Facebook thing works out. People aren't going to be um, like funneling in questions on Facebook, are they? Should we have that up? Uh, nah, I've got it up. If I see anything, 
cool that I'll 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 okay. intersect at the end and do that. Wow. But our kids put quite a few questions in, so I mean, yeah. At this point, it's going to take quite a while to. I, I don't I don't want to go two hours into this thing. It's more like a forty-five minute kind of maybe an hour oh. deal. Hey Nick, um, hey man, what's what's up, kids? Is it Abel or Abel? Uh, I'll call him Abel. Abel, okay. Abel's on here. Abel, can you pronounce your name? Sure, Abel. Yeah, okay. there you go. All right. Here's an Allison Newman. Oh, I know oh. Her. Where? She's Where jumping. She She's jumping in. All right, I'm going to mute everybody real quick and then unmute the host. No. Allison! <laughs> <laughs> All right, now it's a lot quieter. Can uh, can all the co uh, Dave, can you chat for me? Say something real quick. Yep, here I am. Right. Here's the Bryce. How about sound? Yep. Say something. I think, I think I'm good. All right, Lauren. Hey, yo. Eric. Hey. Craig. Hey. Yep, <laughs> cool. All right, we're all uh, the, the proper people are unmuted. All right. Well, it's three o'clock. Uh, we're going to let this thing kind of begin to roll on. So we wanted to, uh, Max and I kind of thought about this on a, on a run or chat. And one of the many times we talk a day, Lauren's probably sick of me talking to her husband. Um, but we thought it'd be good for kids to be able to reach out to athletes that have been on every end of the spectrum with regards to experience. Uh, this is obviously unprecedented and everyone's being, affected by this in some way shape or form and I think you can do one of two things you can uh, either accept this adapt and move on or you can kind of dwell on it I think everyone's had a mixed bag of emotions um, seniors are the kind of the ones that are very unique to this uh, I think they have been in a situation where they they're they're really not sure how to continue to be motivated uh, they know they've got a crazy coach who will put on a senior meet for them at some point um, whether it's June, July, or August before they leave for college. So they know they got to stay fit. But um, I know the professional side of things, according to Max and Lauren, uh, you guys have been wanting to reach out and kind of share your experiences. And, and I'm pretty sure you're probably bored too, uh, unless you're Craig. Craig says his life has not changed one bit, um, <laughs> which I have no doubt. But I wanted to open it up uh, initially to our high school guys, and then I figured it'd be a good idea to kind of open this up to a, a larger group of kids and then put it out, put it out there on Facebook Live. So uh, Bill Hoffman says, what's up? Um, but anyways, I'm going to turn this over to Dave Milner because he's got the gift for Gab, and he's way better at the emceeing side of uh, things. He's, he's the race director for uh, Music City uh, Distance Carnival. He's been at the Ed Murphy Classic for the last uh, two or three years now. He's done a fantastic job with that. Um, but he's going to introduce the athletes uh, along with himself. Uh, credit to him for the graphics. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dave at this point. So take it over. All right. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, we're excited to have four professional runners join us here um, from Arizona, California, Oregon, and Nashville. And um, each, has re each represented USA uh, internationally in 2019. And between them, they've gone at American status in college 17 times. If you've watched the Ed Murphy Classic here in Memphis or, or participated in it, you've seen three of them race in person. Um, hopefully by the end of this Facebook Live event, we'll get the odd man out to, uh, we'll coerce him into coming in Memphis too. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna introduce um, just a quick bio one, one by one for those who are unfamiliar with these athletes. So uh, first of all, we have Lauren Paquette, who from Little Rock, Arkansas, she ran collegiately for Baylor, um, now currently living in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, and she runs for the Northern Arizona Elite Team, sponsored by Hoka. Um, at Baylor, she was a three-time All-American, um, concentrated mostly on 800 and 1500 meters. And in uh, 2000 she says seven-time All-American? Seven, seven? I'm not including <laughs> academics. Or second team. <laughs> not amateur hour. Continue. <laughs> and then um, in 2016, under the guidance of her husband, Max, she began running 5K and had immediate success, um, winning 
Mount Sac Relays in 1520. She would go on to run 1514, her current PB, running the Olympic trials. In 2018, she was fourth at the US Champs at that distance. Uh, last year, ran in the Pan Am Games, ran 1514 again. Um, and then we'll talk about coaching transitions soon, but you know, she recently moved to Flagstaff uh, to join the Northern Arizona Elite Group and is now being coached by Ben Rosario. Um, next up is uh, Eric Avila. Um, he ran, he's from San Diego originally, um, ran for Northern Arizona University for a short time, but graduated from Southern Oregon University where he was a four-time NAIA champion. Um, he was a finalist at the 2016 Olympic trials in the 1500. Um, he won the Ed Murphy mile here in Memphis, 2018, and has the Tennessee outdoor soil record for the mile at 355. Uh, he represented USA last year at the Europe versus USA match in Belarus. And he has run a 336, 1500, uh, 355 mile and currently called San Diego home. And he runs for the uh, Adidas sponsored Golden Coast Track Club. And he's coached by Terrence Mahone. Uh, we have Craig Engels. Um, Craig grew up in Fafftown, North Carolina. It was one of the best prep runners the state produced, ran a 403, 96 mile in high school. Um, he started off his collegiate career at NC State, had a lot of injury issues. Despite that, was Pan Am Junior Games champion his freshman year in 2013. And then he transferred to Ole Miss and uh, under Coach Van Hoy would go on to be a six-time All-American at Ole Miss. At the 2016 Olympic trials, he was fourth and fifth respectively in the 800 and 1500 finals. Um, 2017, he signed a pro contract with Nike and began being coached by uh, Pete Julian. He was the Ed Murphy mile winner in 2017. Is that right, Nick? I believe. Um, and uh, he was the that mile is correct. Yeah. That is correct. And he was the mile champion, indoor, the U.S. mile champion indoors um, last year and also won the U.S. outdoor championships at 1500. He's running a 334.04 1500 meters. And he is infamous for his mullet mustache and on Instagram he chronicles his travel escapades in his RV and also famous for his close friendship with Jenny Simpson. <laughs> <Stop. That's funny. laughs> um, and then last but not least we have Bryce Hopple. Uh, Bryce is from Midland, Texas where he is right now. He's a 149 800 meter runner in high school, signed for the University of Kansas and while at Kansas made steady progress, ran 148 as a freshman, 5 as a sophomore. And then just had an amazing year last year uh, where he won 21 consecutive races. He won the indoor and outdoor NCAA championships, represented USA at Pan Am Games in Peru, and at the World Championships um, a couple of months later, he was a very impressive fourth in the 800 meter final. Um, he notched his first uh, title as a pro uh, indoors in the winter in the 800 meters. So those are our four athletes. So welcome, uh, Lauren, Eric, uh, uh, Craig, and Bryce. And we are going to get started. So we have questions um, that a lot of the kids uh, have submitted, and I'll try and have each question represented. Some of them will be a little bit paraphrased because uh, a lot of the people ask the same questions. Um, but I'll try and keep things flowing. So before we get started, I want to ask each, each of you, so let's go Lauren, Eric, Craig, Bryce. Bryce, I want you to describe very briefly how you got started running and describe briefly your first ever race. What was that, what that was like? So why we started running in our first race? How you got started and then no matter how good or bad it was. <laughs> okay. Um, so I started running in high school. Um, I went to a really, really small Foley were Division 2A in Arkansas, and we didn't have the sport at my school until I was a junior. So I started running at the last meet, the last, I, I ran at state cross country, it was my first meet in high school because we had a very small team and there weren't enough people to score and they looked sick, so they brought me one. And, um, <coughs> It, I just, I used to be fast, like, when I was younger, like, mini Olympics, like, stealing bases from people, like, stuff like that, just, like, PE stuff, and, like, played a bunch of other sports. Um, so, yeah, I got, um, my first race was cross country. They brought us out into this field, and I was like, we just run. They, like, fired a gun. <laughs> 
to start the race off it was really like I don't know just really kind of casual I thought, thought but I walked in my first race because I wasn't ready for the hurt that is cross country. <laughs> um, then I ended up getting third um, at that race. And um, my high school coach at the time just saw potential in me and just encouraged me to keep coming out to practice. And then the rest is history. So yeah, that it wasn't like the most fun first race experience because I just wasn't prepared, but was that freshman year or later Sorry, on? Sorry, you cut out. Was that freshman year or later on? Can you hear me? That was my junior year of high school. Okay, so you started playing. All right. What about you, Eric? Really, I was like, I was just about to turn 18. Yeah. Okay. Nice. <clears throat> uh, Eric, yeah, I grew up in San Diego and I played soccer a lot growing up. And so when the soccer seasons go from I think it was like November to like February or March or something like that in high school where I went to so I was playing like on a club team when I was 14 I think I was 13 actually maybe 14 anyway and some of the guys that were on the soccer team at the high school were running cross country to stay in shape in the fall and so they kind of encouraged me to do it and so I did it and um it went well I think I, I won like our JV county championships they have like a jv thing and so i won that and i remember i was like thinking like oh, maybe i can make varsity next year and then at the end of the season i went to like soccer tryouts and i got pushed onto like the freshman soccer squad and i, I was so pissed off i was like wait what i just almost i'm like probably going to be on varsity in this track this coming spring but now i'm on this freshman thing um squad and so i remember i really wanted a letterman jacket and so I, uh, I quit soccer and you know, started running kind of from there, I guess. Yeah, the and, are, and are you currently wearing an Adidas varsity jacket? <laughs> this is the high school. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is, this is like an Adidas jacket that they, they actually like, just sent. It's kind of cool. It's like, hey, it comes off. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, how about you, Craig? Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I uh... – I don't know. <laughs> I got kicked off my soccer team. I, I played soccer growing up, just like Eric. And uh, I got kicked off. And I didn't want my parents to know why I was coming home early. So I uh, joined the track team. And uh, I started with high jump and wasn't good at that. And then uh, I just, I guess one day I just joined the distance guys on a run. And um, from there, I was just a distance runner. And with the promise of going to college and everything, it was just something I clung on to. But um, I think my first race ever was like a cross country two mile. And my grandparents came into town for it. Uh, they drove up from Georgia and everything. Um, and I think I probably ran like 11 minutes, but it was, I don't know, it was a, it was a fun experience. <clears throat> Bryce? Uh, it's weird. I also kind of like came from soccer. Uh, and it was like my sophomore year, the coach was like, hey, like you guys should come out, uh, try and stay, like stay in shape for soccer. So I was like, all right, I'll give it a try. So I ended up making good friends on the cross country team. I was like, oh, I'm pretty, pretty good at this. So then my junior year, that's when I kind of like started running track and definitely. Uh, but then I think my first race was like, I went to like a private school, like Catholic private school. So they had us start in like first grade and it was just kind of like a little field day race, but I remember being pretty quick at the 200 meters. But that's that's the first race that I can remember. Yeah. All right. So we're going to move ahead and start like uh, inserting the questions that uh, that came from uh, the Memphis Youth Athletics runners. So the first question we have is from Robert Randall, um, and this is a question for everybody. So you guys feel free to inject, but let's let's keep the sort of same um, order, like unless specified otherwise. So we'll go Lauren. Uh, Lauren, Eric, Craig, Bryce. So um, this is a question for everybody. Can you describe the college recruiting process for you? And um, with the benefit of hindsight, tips how you might navigate it now if you're in the same situation. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wasn't recruited for college <laughs> um, because just with the, I had a year, basically a year and a half or something that I ran in high school and I was just so underdeveloped that like 
a bunch of colleges didn't really look look at me necessarily. Um, but I, uh, so I was a walk on at Baylor. I was already going to go there regardless if I was going to run or not. I was a music major and I auditioned and made it, got it into, got into Baylor for that. Um, so I was just going to go and like, I wanted to run, um, as well, but so I wasn't. Tell, tell people how fast you ran for a mile in high school. Oh gosh, guys, like you have so much room to improve. <laughs> I will say, cause I ran, I ran 511 for the mile and then like 220 in the 800 and my we ha yeah like my two mile was 1225 <laughs> out of high school <laughs> so I mean that's not it's not like you know it, there it's respectable but just like to get a scholarship or something like that for D1 it's not going to be super competitive when you have girls like when I was in high school like Texas, my, my, one of my freshman roommates had run four, 439 in the mile that I was coming in the same time, you know, so it makes sense. Um, Who's your roommate? But, um, well, I mean, actually, sorry, a teammate. This girl is Erin Bedell. She was in Texas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. My, my roommate was actually another girl from Arkansas. But <laughs> Um, yeah, so I wasn't super recruited, but I would say, you know, if I are trying to, to run and call, I think and I, um, you, it's, it's important if you want to like excel in college sports to go somewhere that you think is going to fit your, um, your style, basically you're going to improve, but also that you're going to be around people that are going to help grow you as a person, you know, good good coaching staff, good people on the staff, but running doesn't last forever. And some, you know, it's good to pick a college also based on academics and what you want to study. That's very important. Um, everybody would love to go pro or have like a spotless record or, you know, but um, things do happen. So I think it's important to have a good degree to fall back on at the end of the day, if it doesn't pan out. Um, but that's what I would say is like, find yourself a team that you believe in, good teammates, good people to surround yourself with, but also somewhere that you can excel, not just in athletics, but academics as well. How about you, Eric? Um, my recruiting process, I could do it over. Uh, my parents were heavily involved in my recruiting process, almost to the extent that like, I think they almost, they did it more for me, mainly because I didn't really want to go to college. I don't think I was ready. I didn't know what I wanted to study. I just felt like it was like the natural process, like I should go. Um, I just wanted to run. And so I remember like not really being that interested, um, but being heavily recruited because I was having a lot of success uh, in high school when I was running. Uh, looking back, I think maybe I should, probably should have taken a gap year or something like that just to grow up a little more and get some, just grow up, I guess, and get stuff out of my system. But but when I remember when I was going through it, like I would talk to the coaches and then um, I would just like hand my phone to my parents and be like, I don't know, there you talk to them. And then eventually I remember they were like, oh, well, you know, we don't want you to go um, to the East Coast or far away. So you can you can go to school like in California or like if it's touching the state lines. And I was like, okay. And I looked up like the top running schools and like uh, I really wanted to go to Oregon because I, I was like, racing guys like Centralitz in high school. And I remember I was like, oh yeah, I, I want to go run with them and Free Fontaine. And, and then, um, but I remember the coach like didn't call me back. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so um, I was looking at a couple other schools and then NAU was on the radar and I was like, all right, like I'll go here and run. And then I guess I'll just like figure out the schooling thing along the way. So I did like dental and stuff, stuff to my plan. Um, but then the rest is history, I guess. But but yeah, it was kind of a weird, I guess it's a weird recruiting process. If I can go back. Sorry? Go okay. good. What would you do oh, different? Yeah. No, yeah, if I go back and do anything different, I guess I would just uh, actually like take time to, to figure out what I wanted to do and almost be more transparent, not to waste anyone's time. I guess. Like, if I can go back, maybe I would tell people, hey, I'm going to gap year or two. And, or, um, hey, I want to be more involved in the recruiting process. I still think it was good to go to NAU at the time. Like, I just don't think I was ready. So there's that, that I think people can take from that. You know, everyone's in a different boat. Um, so yeah. How about you, Craig? 
Um, I, God, I, I don't really quite remember everything that happened, but um, the thing I remember the most and would change the most about the recruiting process is like when you go on a visit to a school, whether it's like unofficial or official, you don't really get a feel for that program or that team's chemistry or anything just because like they get, I mean, the, the, the freshmen are the ones hosting you and they, they really haven't even learned what school is like. They, they've been there for like two months taking you on entertaining trips and stuff. So I was going to be the most fun and everything, but um, what happens to school is the most fun of my visit, but it wasn't the best fit for me. And uh, luckily the NCAA has made it super easy to transfer. Um, so after two and a half years at NC State, I transferred to Ole Miss um, and started running well and I was happy and um, everything else changed from there. And what, from what I know, it's easier to transfer now. Um, yeah. But it kind of sucks because, like, you leave these friends you left behind that you really wanted to, like, stay with, but you know the program's not right for you. So a lot of people get torn and they just quit and stay at the school. Um, so it's, it's, it's super tough when you're 17, 18 years old to decide where you want to be for the next four or five years, and I guess now six years. <laughs> So, Craig, my main question to you is, like, I mean, you, you're from North Carolina, and mm -hmm. obviously, you, know, you ran 403 in high school, so you would have been heavily recruited. You seem like a pretty adventurous kind of guy. I think that's an understatement. How come you chose to go to school so close to home? Um, so, I actually wasn't very good until the end of high school. Um, I think, like, I mean, I, had run, I ran 415 in the last race of my junior year. It was like a meet that was after states and everything. And that was really good. But you don't really – like that you get recruited on like your senior year cross country. Like that's when you're doing your visits and everything. So all I had to on my resume was the 415, um, which, I mean, it's still, it's, it's still like pretty good and will get you into a lot of colleges. But I actually only visited northern Arizona, and they took me rock cli outdoor rock climbing, and like it, it was awesome. Um, but I had a girlfriend at the time. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty sure that's why I chose to stay in North Carolina, but we didn't really work out. <laughs> I was going the way, long way around the answer. <laughs> you hear those boys? You hear that, boys? Take that advice. <laughs> Frank, what would you, what would you, with the benefit of hindsight, what would you do differently now? I wouldn't do anything different. It all worked out. Yeah. Um, like that's the, the greatest thing about like life and everything is usually you get a second chance. And um, if it was something like this, I mean, it's not like you're bound to anything for the rest of your life. It's, it's a cool, it's a cool opportunity you've gotten to run in college and um, possibly go to school for a discounted rate, you know? So if you don't like it, then you leave. <laughs> so I would, yeah, I wouldn't change anything. It was, it's, it's been, it's been a good ride. All right. Bryce. Uh, I'd say I had no clue what I was doing <clears throat> when I was going into the recruiting process. So it was kind of like a lot of fun. I kind of just tried to take the approach of like, go see everywhere. So like me and my mom took like a road trip across Texas and went to like basically every school there is to see in Texas. Uh, so I kind of just took that approach of like seeing everything I could. Um, was your high school coach involved at all? Uh, not really actually. Like I didn't, I mean, my high school coach was great and stuff. But, like, he, he wasn't that involved in, like, pushing us to that next level because we kind of had, like, a special thing going on in Midland where we had, like, a really cool group of guys that were good and we were, like, the only ever to, like, come through the system here in Midland. So everything was, like, new to the coaches and stuff of sending people off to the college. Uh, so that, that was kind of, like, new. But then I think the thing that I looked for the most was when I went to Kansas, it was, like, the coach and the team was, like, everything that I was looking for. And that's what kind of drew me in rather than like, I mean, Kansas is a pretty good program, but like I never was all that drawn to like anything prestigious, just like any of like the big schools or anything. Right. Okay. Um, so we've got a question from Anthony Sestaro. Hopefully I'm saying his name right. That's, cor that's correct. He's asking uh, all of you, if you could tell your high school self one thing, what would it be? If you could go back in time. <coughs> and give some advice to your high school, to your 18 year old or 17 year old self, what would that be? That one pearl of wisdom. Oh gosh, <laughs> that's a lot of 
pressure. <laughs> um, yeah. I yeah, I would. Does someone want to take this? Then I need my need to think about that. If I'll someone wants that. to go first. <laughs> For me, yeah. I'd say like, take it all in. Like the next step, and the next step. It all seems like it goes by so fast. It's like going back to high school, I'm sort of like just like take it all in more. Cause like at that time I feel like I'm ready for the next thing and for the next thing. And then when you get to college, like, oh, okay, I'm ready to like move on to the next thing. So I guess I would feel myself to just like enjoy it all while it lasts, I guess. Good advice. Craig, Eric, anything? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say have fun with it and enjoy every step of the, uh, the process um, and never take yourself too seriously, <laughs> which <laughs> you could take to an extreme, but um yeah, just never take yourself too seriously. Oh, and the, the one thing I will recommend about running is, like, a lot of high school kids get caught on times. Uh, but a good college coach is really just going to, like, recognize you for winning races. Um, they, like, a lot of college coaches know they can make a lot of kids fast, but they can't get a lot of kids to win races. So uh, if you're more worried about winning your race than running fast, then you're going to do better in college. That's good advice. Eric? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I started laughing when Craig was talking because I was like, damn it, Craig. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, just, just have fun with it. If I could have told myself, I would have said probably that, and I probably would have said um, don't look at your watch so much. Maybe you don't even run with the watch. And sometimes just go off feel because I remember getting caught up in, like, the clock at times and or pace, like, especially my teammates. Um, yeah, like, oh, we got to go this pace. We got to go this pace. And that's not necessary. Especially now, um, easy runs, I won't. I won't wear the watch. I want to look at it, and I wish I did that. Back. <laughs> then you can't coach keep track of it. I I never wear it because I probably hit a little under my mileage all the time. <laughs> <laughs> You're always fresh, then, all right. You're always recovering. I always feel fresh. Yeah. Okay. So this sort of first current set of questions is mostly about transitions, either from you know high school to college or college to pro. So one of the questions we've got is. Um, from Adam Willett and Adam asked, when did you know you wanted to be a professional athlete and how did you go about becoming one? So this might be a little bit of insight as to like how it happens, how agents get involved, when do agents get involved? Um, so let's start with Lauren first. Yeah, um, I, I guess, I guess when I first thought about the possibility of becoming a pro athlete. Like when I, so when I graduated from Baylor, um, I ran like, I ran 415 in the 1500. And like at the time I ran like 204 in the 800 or something. Um, I didn't really get like any kind of contract or funding um, that first year out of college, but then the first year out, I, I, I did sign with an agent. Um, but I kind of thought like, I think I'm pretty good. I still don't think I've really tapped out because I got such a late start in running. Like I'm gonna like sign with an agent out of college and just see if anything happens. And then if I like it, I'll keep going with it. I, I don't think it was necessarily like, I've always wanted to be a professional athlete or anything like that. It was just kind of like, I'm still finishing. I, I still had my degree to finish up in, at Baylor because it took me like six years to graduate. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like I was much more gradual than, than the other mine, guy. Yeah, mine didn't, wasn't just like boom right away it happened. But that first year I got to run a lot of really great meets. Um, even without a contract, I got into a bunch of races with like people that were a lot faster than me um, and older than me. And I got dragged to running a 409, 1500, and then a six signed me for a couple of years out of college. So it just kind of like happened that way for me. But, um, yeah, like I didn't honestly, like, like I had never, like I'm 33 years old now. I had, I had never gone through the, um, any kind of recruiting process for like college or pro teams until this year. <laughs> so it's a little different um, because it wasn't like I had tons of people like vying for me or anything. But I think my biggest thing now looking back is like having longevity in the sport. Like I still feel like I have progress to be made and, you know, um, 
So it's like if, it, if things don't happen right away, that doesn't mean they won't happen, but you just have to be receptive and be open to different opportunities and kind of like when you get those opportunities, take them, yeah. like make, make the most of those when they, when they happen because they don't, sometimes they're far and few between. So. Yeah. Eric? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, so I, I talked earlier about like taking time and maybe if I could go back, I would take a gap year. I ended up doing that. And then I went to a small NAI school. Yeah, talk um, a little bit about your, like how you ended up at NA, NAU and then you had a gap and then you went to Southern Oregon, correct? So just maybe just expand on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, yeah, so I went to NAU and as they are now, they were like a huge power and really good. But I remember, it, again, like I said, I wasn't really ready and, and the guys were so good that I kind of, I would show up and kind of get my butt kicked. And I remember I was like, well, this isn't fun. And in high school, it was like so much fun to win. And I just like competing. And I remember they were running all this mileage. And I, I think I did like 25, 30 miles a week in high school and they're doing 70 to hundred. And I remember I was, I did, I liked the idea of racing and competing at a high level, but I definitely wasn't interested in training at all. And so that ended up, that doesn't really go together, you know, um, that, and then I wasn't really interested in going to class as much as I was, uh, getting on like Call of Duty or Halo and, and like a bunch of games with friends, um, in the halls. So eventually, um, when you don't go to class, uh, you, you end up having, getting asked nicely to leave the school. So that's what ended up happening to me, which I think was uh, probably a good thing. So I left, I just spent a couple years, like two years back in San Diego. Um, I was like mowing lawns at the time, it was the housing market crash. So I was doing that and I was kind of surfing and I had a girlfriend and I kind of just was just having a good time. And and then eventually, uh, just like anything, the girlfriend and I, we split up. And then I was like, okay, what the hell am I doing? I'm just deep bum, and I'm not doing anything. And I um, started going back to a junior college. And one of the guys that was in my class, he was on the track team. And he was like, hey, I know who you are. Because I had won like high school stuff back a couple years prior. And he was asking me to come out to run track. And at this time, I was like 160. 570 pounds right now I'm like 135 140 and so I was like oh man I don't run anymore I don't know and then he ended up dragging me out just because I was like all right I have nothing to do I might as well come out and run with you guys and then I went to some races and then eventually I actually went to the 2011 U.S. champs for fun like on a road trip and I watched Centro win the 1500 and I remember seeing him and other guys that I used to race in high school and I was like what the hell like if I just you know kept to it maybe I could have been here so I ended up, while I was up there in Oregon, I ended up checking out in Oregon in a couple of schools and um, the guy slid like a scholarship offer across the table while I was there that weekend. And I was like, I laughed at him because I was like, dude, do you realize like, like I suck, like I'm not good anymore. And he was like, well, like what shape are you in? And I was like, well, I ran a 5k last weekend for fun with my friends and I'm in 1640. And he was like, well, what'd you run in high school? And I told him and then he was just like, all right, like I ran nine flat and 412 um but and he was like all right well talent doesn't go away so like you know, we're still interested and so i took it and then ended up going to southern oregon and um yeah i mean the first year i actually was like on academic probation because i came in with like my transfer credits from nau that weren't that good and so i had to sit out like two terms there aren't quarters up there how old were you when you how old you started at southern, how old were you when you started at southern oregon you like 21? I was 21. Okay. I was 21. So I was 17 when I got to NAU and then I left in 19 and then I spent two years and then I went to Southern Oregon at 21 and I had like one semester of junior college in between there that I like took like three classes I think um, and then I was 21 and then I turned 22 shortly after arriving on campus and the coach was awesome he just was like just go run every day just go jog like we're not gonna put any races on the schedule and I would just like run with the guys and hang out and, and then slowly things just kind of progressed as they do and whatever. Um, but then, yeah, fast forward uh, three years, I was a senior at Southern Oregon. And at that time, I just really wanted like the college experience. Like I really wanted to get my degree, kind of prove to myself that like, if I focus, I can, you know, I'm capable. And then, um, and I kind of wanted to like have that college experience, have friends, be part of a team, you know, all this stuff. And so I got to do all that. 
I didn't really think a ton past it. I was doing some internships in the springtime, but this was my senior year where I was also seeing success on the track. And it wasn't until like, there was one race that I remember thinking like, maybe I could be a pro. And then there was a, there, like a race and one month later that was like, okay, yeah, I, I could be a pro. And the first one was I ran a 1500 at, at Hayward Field and it was against Centralitz. And I remember uh, I was really eager to race him because I, I raced in high school and it had been this long gap. And he ended up beating me by, it was like 0.12, really close. Mm -hmm. And it was 1500 and I took him to the line. And then I remember after that, I was like, I mean, maybe he, you know, I thought he wasn't sharp and ready. It was like a mid April race. So it was probably kind of like a tune up for him. But the fact that I, I could, you know, get a little confidence from like maybe taking him to the line. And then um, fast forward like a month and I broke the floor for the first time because uh, we don't run the mile in, uh, in, you know, we're in 1500 and my school doesn't have a big budget. So we never ran indoors. So I didn't get to run the mile from that whole time I was there. So that was a big opportunity, broke four. And, but I broke four by a lot. I ran um, 356, my first sub four. And I got a call like two days later from Ray Flynn. And he, I don't even know, I was like, how'd you get this number? And he was like, oh, I called your school. And then they gave me your coach's number and your coach gave me your number. And Ray Flynn, if you guys don't know, he's, a, uh, he's Craig and I's agent. And- uh, This was 2016, right? This was 2014. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is 2014. Um, and then he just called me and was like, yeah, you know, he was telling me all about the pro running world. And I had no idea. The only thing I knew about Ray was I knew Ray managed Alan Webb running ball just from like reading stuff from growing up. And so I was like, you're this, you're that dude. You're that dude that manages those other dudes. And so <laughs> right away I was like, okay, uh, <laughs> like a deer in the headlights. I was like, um, so what do you think? And he was just like, oh, I think this and this. And he was talking numbers and stuff. And, and then he was just like, okay, well, you're going to go to USA's and, you know, you, you need to make the final and then we can do this, whatever. But it was all like, like another language to me. And so you're, it was cool. You're, he guided uh, me. Yeah. Your first contract offer, I and mean, I'm not going to ask you to divulge too much in detail, but your first contract offer, was that like a livable wage? Or was that something you had to supplement? Sure. With? So it's kind of a funny story. Um, I don't know how much I can divulge, uh, but, but basically, so I ended up signing with Hoka and I signed a three and a half year contract. Um, and they were a brand new company at the time in 2014. They had just come under new management and everything. And, um, it was cool. So they were overpaying athletes. I would say they were paying us more than maybe our value because they were trying to steer uh, athletes away from other companies. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and it worked, obviously, like I was super grateful. I think they, I don't think I was necessarily valued at what maybe they were offering me. Um, but at the time I didn't know that it's not the looking back. I see now how it, how it kind of all laid out, but the president at the time of Hoka, and this is just kind of ironic. He, um, he, he used to, he, so he had something to do with the Aggies and, and basically it's a big running group on California. You guys have probably heard of runningwarehouse.com. Um, a lot of runners get their shoes from there. So basically the president of Hoka has, has a relationship with that guy. And that guy that owns Running Warehouse used to coach my college coach. So it's just funny how everything's connected. I'm sure um, everyone has those connections where sometimes when you get the contracts, it's not always based on what you've done. And sometimes it is very much like communication and, and relationships with people. And so when I got my Hoka contract, I realized it was almost like a, uh, yeah, it was politics, and it, but it was awesome. I mean, I'm super grateful that it worked out that way. But, yeah. Okay, cool. So Bryce, Bryce and Craig, you, you guys had a, you know, a sort of a, a more sudden transition, I guess. So Craig, why don't you talk first um, about like how that happened for you? Yeah. Uh, wait, first off, who's, who's asking this question? Is it a high school kid? Um, yeah, that's Adam Willett. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's very um, cerebral. Fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're asking this question when you're in high school, it's a, it's a deep one. Um, I, I probably didn't know I was going to go pro till my senior year of college. And I mean, I never thought about it and never put pressure on it. So, um, you I mean, I it, it, Craig, Craig, you, you had a hashtag on your Instagram in your junior year of college. <laughs> it said, get that contract. <laughs> and that was, uh, hold on, let me, let me flip the camera. This guy uh -huh. right here started that contract. <laughs> is that what that is from? I remember that. Did you start that? I was actually supporting it. I was like, get this guy a contract, get this guy a contract. That's funny. Yeah, uh, 
Ryan Manahan ran, ran for Ole Miss. He started that when he was at like a freshman in college or something as a joke. Yeah, so right. always, that's how I know that. Okay, sorry. Yeah, Ro- Robert Demanic's here too, who's also a pro for Reebok. Oh man, oh, wow. you got the crew there. Yeah, yeah. We, got a squad. Oh. we got we got Taylor Caldwell, who's uh, Brent. He went to Brentwood High or Brentwood? Yeah, Brentwood High. We could just run MCDC tomorrow. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you do a virtual one. Turn I'll miss it. Up. No. We got a good four by eight here, although maybe Taylor's <laughs> a little out of shape. Yeah, I don't know. Everyone's path is different, as you could tell from the past two stories. But um, I'd say Bryce and I had it a little bit more straightforward than the than the other two. Um, I don't know. Yeah, but I wouldn't even worry. I would never worry about go- – I didn't worry about going pro until it happened. Now, for, for those that don't really know how it works, can you maybe – and Bryce, feel free to interject here – Explain when in the process you first got approached by or your agent. Uh, for me, I mean, I never knew I was going to go pro. So, like, it, it kind of just, like, for me, it all built up so quickly and it just kept building and building. And it was literally, like, one day. It was, like, the day of that, like, final of the USATF championships. It was, like, all right, I'm going back for my fourth year at Kansas. And then the next day, like, really early in the morning, my coach was, like, all right, like, you're going pro. I'm, like, okay. Like, it's because they started hearing – I guess, well, a few people approached me before then and kind of leading up to that day, but they were finally like, all right, you need to get out of here because they had connections with global athletics and like uh, Mark Wetmore and stuff and already, uh, so like it kind of just all happened very quickly for me. And then within like a couple of weeks, it was just like all kind of set and done. And I don't know, I, I never knew I was going to go pro, but it all just kind of like hit so quickly. All right. <clears throat> Hopefully that answered your question, Adam. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about training. And f- my first question to you guys, all three of you, I want you to quote three numbers. And it's your approximate weekly mileage in high school, college, and now as a pro, if that's different. So ready? this is going to be rapid fire. Lauren, you're up. Okay, so high school, I think I might have ran like 25 to maybe 20 to 30 miles a week. And then my freshman year, I think I was, I got bumped up to like 40 to 50. Um, Baylor's more of a like volume type school. Um, And then it really didn't increase that much the entire, like my five and a half years at Baylor. Um, I think I might've been, maybe my highest was like 65 but my workouts were harder and like more volume on the long runs and the like just amount of intervals I would do um, increase more so than just my volume. And um, now, well, NAZ is pretty mileage based, but then Rosario is my coach now and he's done a pretty good job of, I've been here for three months and he's, he's been slowly progressing me, but I hit uh, this week is scheduled to be my highest ever and it's going to be 80. Um, which seems kind of high to me, (laughs) but since I've been here, I've been like from 55 to 70. So yeah, we'll go down next week. Eric, so you said you ran really long mileage. Yeah. Uh, mine would be, you asked, I was like, I was like, oh, 30, 60, 90. Those are my numbers. I guess that's (laughs) I remember looking back, I like, I, uh, my senior year of high school, I used flow tracks, like, it was like really big, they used to have all their mileage on there, you can like log it, kind of like Strava or something like that, and I remember when I got to NAU, the coach was like, hey, can you send over your logs from your flow track stuff that you've been keeping, and I sent it to him, and I remember he was like, did you not log, and I was like, no, no, that's my training, and he was like, your last month, like, I think it was like month of May, my senior year, he's like, you average 21 miles a week, and I was like, yeah, that's that's it that's yeah that's everything. He's like did you not include the warm-up I was like no dude my warm-up was a mile jog like what are you talking about and then we were I told him we were peaking which is true but I can see now why he's like what but I remember every year I only had about four weeks of good racing and then I would just get really tired I was like this is yeah. so but probably because I was running 30 miles a week or something. yeah now, now yeah. Bryce is an 800 guy I would expect yours to be a little bit lower but what, what were your numbers <laughs> I couldn't even tell you in high school. I literally showed up to practice and just, they just, I just did whatever they told me. I would, I would say maybe 
maybe like 20 miles, I guess. I I literally showed up and just had fun. Uh, college, I was probably like 45 at the best. Did you run cross country? Uh, uh, when I was in cross country, you said? You run cross country for Kansas? Oh yeah, I did. I was never, <laughs> I was never that great at it. Um, but no, I stayed around. I 55 was probably the highest I ever got, and that that's pretty rough for me. <laughs> Angles, you're up. Oh, you on me? Yeah. I'm not gonna take part in this because mileage does not matter. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Just hit one good long. God's fire. Work out. <laughs> Ten. <laughs> I don't Love know what it. happened. Love it. It's a valid point. People get caught up on, you know, just uh, with the mileage and, and, you know, trying to outdo themselves or others. Um, that is true. All right, let's move on. Um, why is it my photo? Why is my photo the main photo? Is that for I don't know. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you're talking. Wait, gallery view. There you go. Oh, Chris, <laughs> did you, did that fix it? There you go. Okay. Yes, yeah. someone fixed it. <laughs> I did my job. <laughs> uh, one more, uh, a couple more training questions. So this is a pretty simple question. Um, this is from Samuel Tankersley. And he says, how fast or slow are your easy recovery runs? I think people will be surprised at some of these answers. Good question. And I don't even think about my pace on easy runs, recovery runs. It's whatever my body needs for that day. And I, I think people get so caught up in like, you have to run a certain pace all the time. And like, I, I would say, honestly, I range from like 645 to like 815 pace. And it, it just depends on like what I need. And sometimes 815 pace feels just as hard as like six minute pace depending on, you know, the day before I might've done a really hard workout or a long run. And then I need to really just get some, get the, the work in, but not worry about that so much and just enjoy my environment or like talking to a teammate or the scenery or something like that. Like, um, I do remember when I first got to Baylor, Garmin had just come out with all their GPS watches and they did a, they did a study on, um, they gave us uh, my, my Baylor cross country team, they gave us all prototype watches and told us to log our mileage and our pace and all that every day. And my teammate and I got to the point where like, if we weren't running 615 pace for an easy run, we were thinking we were out of shape and it just, it can just get in your head so easily. And like that season, it got to where like, I couldn't tell a difference between my easy run like how that felt versus a workout based on effort because I was just running myself into the ground. Um, so I definitely think with easy runs, it's just go by feel and go with what your body needs. And like, if you need to run soft surface one day or like trails or easy trails or whatever, cause you need a break from the pounding, like do that like this. So on Monday this week, I ran some trails and Flagstaff and I ran like nine minute pace on them. <laughs> And it's right. just, it's just cause like they're kind of technical and they're uphill and everything, but like, I don't really care about that because it's when I needed that day. And it's actually like, I found that I find that a lot more enjoyable than like worrying about it all the time. Like I like to, you know, that's part of running. Like I like to run fast and I like to compete and like when it's time to hit a workout hard, I like to hit my splits, but I also like to just be and enjoy the process of it in the moment. So yeah, and that's I, I I just think people get too caught up in it personally. But. I agree. But, but Bryce, Eric, I mean, like day after a hard workout on the track, how slow are you running? Um, should be running really slow. I was like Bryce and I were living together in January for a little camp, and I sometimes get caught up in like with when we're at a camp and I know we're racing soon, and so sometimes you know, I would like push our hair, I would maybe go a little too fast. But usually, I mean, if we just did a workout the day before. Yeah, I mean, we'll start off at eight minute pace, seven forty five pace for the first like I don't know mile, and then we'll roll into it and run around seven minutes, and then get under seven by the end of the run. But that's not uncommon to do, to have a, a run way out that way. Bryce, same. Yeah, probably go as slow as I can go. I try to find myself in the backpacking can just and just kind of talk with the dude and go. As, yeah, go as slow as I can. <laughs> Craig, Craig, serious question for you: Do you even own a Garmin? No. Yeah. <laughs> it's the polar, that's why. <laughs> I go by where the sun is in the sky. 
shit. <laughs> <laughs> what if it's cloudy? I don't know. I can't count. We never learned that at Ole Miss. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit shorter so we can stay on track and get through these questions. So um, this is the last question on sort of transitions. So if you could pick one thing, what, what has been the one, the biggest single factor that has been the difference between uh, running as a professional athlete and running as a collegiate athlete? Um, I would say maybe the, the structure of it. Um, I mean, you know, now it's a little different than when I first came out of college because there weren't as many, there are a lot of, there are a lot more groups now that are around. Um, so it's kind of like going from, you know, your college team to like a professional team where you have still have people to run with. But I would say, I don't know, I probably have a different perspective because when I first came out, it wasn't like that. It was like most people were signing individual contracts. So mm -hmm. for me, it was basically like, I went from having a team and having, you know, everything kind of done for you, like travel plans and all that with NCAA to like, okay, now I need to find motivation to train solo or like I need to book my flights or like I need to find somewhere to stay or right. like find where I'm going to eat versus like in college, everything was just like, you know, you drive somewhere on a bus or get off a plane and some place to race and they have an itinerary for you. So I think that was the biggest thing for me. The same with your art? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. The structure is probably the biggest difference. Um, a lot of it, like I, I saw a lot of the questions from the guys um, down in Memphis about like, you know, how do you stay motivated and stuff like that. And like, that would, that's like a common theme, you know, it's uh, yeah. Sometimes it's very, it is an individual sport. And then especially as you get older, you know, your friends move on and stuff. And um, so that's where the team is like comes into play. So. Bryce or Craig? Um, one difference? I, I, I said the, the um, professional running and college running isn't that different. You just have to find what to do with your extra time. But the change from high school to college is the biggest, uh, where you're like living with your parents and then you go to all this freedom. Um, and it's sometimes tough to handle that. And um, you see a lot of college runners either not doing well or doing super well with their newfound freedom. Um, so, I mean, but it's an exciting time. It's, it's really cool that like that change is the coolest, I think, in the whole running background so bryce i'm interested in your transition because you're not a lot has changed for you right you're still the same coach still taking classes yeah. in kansas you know, honestly now you don't have the races yeah. often and like obviously it's like kind of bigger races and stuff but it's still yeah. just racing and i really haven't had much difference for me other than like the competition i guess uh but no i, I like it it's it's still just all racing and you kind of just do what you can out there now what's your living situation do you live with guys on the team uh yeah i was living in a house with four other guys but i just got my own place in kansas uh so i'll probably be back and forth between there and uh might go down and train in san diego with eric and them dudes but yeah still just at the ku finishing up classes okay um all right we're going to talk about you know i think one of the biggest differences between being a college runner and a high school runner and being a pro runner is that you sort of take care of the little things like that you maybe didn't have time to do because your classes got in the way or, you know, social activities and now you're more focused. Um, so let me ask you, this is a question from John Barnett and I might paraphrase it a little bit, but he asks, how do you recover from your workouts? So I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. How do you recover differently now you're a professional athlete than you might have in college or high school? Naps. And is this for anybody or? Nap. I nap more, which is like, I think huge, but I'm a big napper. So I didn't get to nap as much in college. And now I get to nap a lot more. But that almost comes with a double edged sword because I get to nap. I'm feeling good more often. So then I sometimes catch myself like pushing the envelope more frequently than I should. So there's like a. Like, <gasps> so. Yeah, I mean, I'm the same. I like, I literally like don't skip a nap. Like, that's you know like when you're in college like a lot of times like for us like in Texas we had it's so hot and humid you know we had practice before classes started like at six in the morning and then you have to like go immediately to class you have to kind of rush and like eat and everything and, and so yeah it's like now that like when when you are a pro like you do have more like time on your hands and so now like my routine is I'll go do my workout and then 
I try to eat something right away and then get a full meal in as soon as possible. And then I pretty much go to sleep. <laughs> so I don't really like nap that long, but I'll take like 20 to 45 minute naps probably every day. And then like, I know like for me, like I need like nine, to, nine to 10 hours of sleep a night. That's just it. But yeah, like you just have more time to pay attention to those little things, I think. And then I also wish when I was younger that um, I had taken more time to like focus on my body, like as far as like just stretching and like stuff after the run. Like if I have a little, like something like tendonitis or something, like I would kind of just be like, oh, whatever. And like now it's like I pay more attention to it and just kind of like do what I can to take care of it versus just let it like, oh, play out on its own. So that's kind of like how things have changed for me. But Okay. Yeah, I think I've noticed like all those little recovery things just help you a lot with those like day to day workouts and stuff. It wasn't really anything I prioritized kind of when I was younger, but like now yeah. you kind of realize how all those little things help. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, I got a couple of questions that are related to nutrition. So I'm going to like touch on those real fast. Um, so Andrew Wade asked um, in order to be a better runner, how and what should I eat? So that's a bit of a it's a bit of a broad question. So I'm going to paraphrase his question a little bit and ask you specifically, um, what is the biggest thing or the, the thing that you think you sacrifice the most? Like, so by not eating or not drinking during race season, like what's something that you might like give up like it was Lent for racing season <laughs> and then quickly resume once the racing season's over? I don't really... I don't really, nothing's off limits for me. Like, I don't really give up anything. I might not, like, I don't know, like, eat as much ice cream that I want. Like, I'm a big ice cream person. <laughs> so I might not eat as much when I get towards the racing season. But honestly, like, there's a big, like, container of ice cream in my fridge right now. Like, um, I just try to eat pretty balanced. And, like, I eat a lot of veggies. I, eat, I don't eat a ton of like pasta and stuff like that. I eat a lot of grains, um, like quinoa and farro and whatever, like that kind of stuff. But yeah, I, I like my dessert and I, I like cheese and like, you know, I think it's, you got to eat your fats. You got to have to have protein after you run hard and you have to obviously eat a lot of carbohydrates because that's what your body fuels itself on. So I just try to eat balance and I, I won't, like not eat something like if I want something like I'm gonna I'm gonna treat myself or just have it yeah how about you Eric do you sacrifice anything um not as much as maybe I should um I kind of got into this thing last year where I started having red wine before like met four races um <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah I do that too <laughs> it's great once I did it I was like oh my God. um but yeah and one of the, the things that maybe I do like I don't know, not stick with on, but is like the probably pre and post fueling. So like before workout or before race and then after, um, maybe I stick to that pretty like stringently. Um, but other than that, other than that, like, no, I probably should tighten things up a little bit, but, um, I don't know if the oven's burning hot enough, it's going to cook anything. That's kind of, so. Craig. Yeah. Um, I'm probably not the best role <laughs> model for this question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I actually eat really well. Uh, I just don't. I mean, like, I don't cut anything out. Ever. Everything in balance, right? Everything, yep. <laughs> so it's just Bryce? perfection, naturally. <laughs> Bryce, is your diet changeable from season to season? I would say my diet changed a lot, just because it used to be terrible. Um, I used to live at Wingstop in Buffalo Wild Wings when I was in high school, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just eating more balanced now has definitely helped a lot. But it, like the so, let's say like the you know, after the World Champs in Doha, did you just splurge on something that you wouldn't have otherwise? Or no? I actually went right after that World Championships. I went to there's like a cool little kind of like sports bar in the hotel, and I went straight got some some uh, some nice stuff. <laughs> Buffalo Wild Wings is trash, just so everyone knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you? What would you substitute instead? It's amazing. I think Wingstop's <laughs> really good for a chain, but you gotta go with your local wing places. They're always the best. Yeah. Any any I'll wing place in Memphis. Yeah. Huh? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Memphis has some good ones. Memphis has great ones. 
That's Y'all, I have, I have cider in literally within walking distance from me down the street and a Huey's in walking distance. So. Well, Rick, Rick Ross owns all the, uh, the wing stops in Memphis, which is hilarious to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when y'all, when y'all come down, That's when y'all come down to college. EMC, you gotta That's go to Ching's. Him. Ching's is the stuff. <gasps> I've still never been there. I can't yeah. believe it. Why is my face big again? <laughs> I don't know. I just changed it. Someone, do you keep, like, someone keeps hitting something. It. It's Eric. It's definitely Eric. <laughs> uh, I, will, I will say, like, my favorite, my favorite post-race meal is, like, a burger and fries. And then, like, honestly, like, my favorite thing post, like, workout is, like, a big burrito. Mm. Like, steak and guacamole and, like, brown rice. And, yeah, that's my, that's my jam. Yeah. All right, let's get back on track. <laughs> um, so Lydia Tankersley has asked, what is your advice on how to incorporate cross training in your running schedule? I know, I know Lauren, you do quite a lot of, or you do quite a lot of cross training anyway, whether you're injured or not. Yeah. We'll start with you. Um, so it kind of depends on what's been going on I think like with your training but yeah like Dave said like I so I started cross training a lot when I was injured just to I I had a span of like three and a half years of just straight injuries where I wasn't competing hardly at all and it was miserable but I basically um just cross trained a a lot during that but I did a bunch of different things I wouldn't get as bored I'd rather be running you know cross training isn't always super fun, but I did get an elliptic go. So I would take that out on the Shelby Farms green line and just hammer that and do like workouts on it and stuff. But even when I'm healthy, I still, I still cross train, but it might be like 10 to 15% of my overall volume for that week. Um, but I think with, with cross training, like it is, it's a, it's a good way to stay healthy, but also get the aerobic like maybe you're not running as much because you're injury prone. Like it's a good way to get um, oh. your aerobic fitness still up there with, without sacrificing your legs by pounding so much. Um, yeah. And I do think also now, like and now that I'm, I'm running a bit more volume here in NAZ, but um, I still like to do a light cross trains in the afternoons because I just find that it helps flush my body out. I just feel better. Um, but cross training, you know, typical cross train, is like, you know, upright biking or elliptically or swimming and stuff that I, I, I've almost kind of come to see like light hiking or like fast, like walking my dog or something as cross training. It's just something to like get you moving. Um, but yeah, like obviously now the gyms are closed <laughs> here, so I'm not doing, I haven't done a lot the last few weeks, but, um, yeah, looking forward to that. I started swimming uh when i first got here which is really hard at altitude but yeah it works it gets yeah. you like really good train if you're he- still healthy you still incorporate it i do yeah yeah i mean i would probably like i so when i got to flagstaff a few months ago i had a little bit of tendonitis and i wasn't running that much so i was slowly like as i was getting healthier week by week i would you know run a little more and i would do a little less cross training but even when I was up to like, which is typically my highest mileage, like 65 to 70, typically, like I'll still do one or two short 25 to 35 minute sessions a week. So okay. I'm just used to it too. Well, like, was, I like it. Was, you cross train, even if you're not injured? Eric? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, not as much as maybe I should. I mean, I think it's a, I, like, I'm a bit advocate for it. I think it's really good, but, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know. I used to swim and cycle I am whenever I was injured, but I've noticed I only kind of do it in those moments, which, um, yeah, I guess I think, a, I think it's fair to say a lot of people don't cross train unless they've had a chronic injury. That's literally, yeah, unless it's like, it's a hand that's forced to me. Otherwise I usually would not, but, um, but yeah, I, I think you like, you should, I was just talking to my teammate yesterday about, how yeah they're like they've been tired but they're they're fine physically but they're just run down and I remember saying like oh why don't you just get on the bike but I say that but like I yeah maybe you should take my own advice. Bryce? Uh, I think it's a great tool but I've never had to do it so 
and I, I don't know. It seems like it'd be fun, like swimming or something, but I was never good at that, so I'd, I'd typically stay away from that stuff. Uh, Craig, you, Craig, you were very injury-ridden, it's fair to say, at NC State. Did you cross-train a lot during that, or did you just sit around and drink wings? You drink beer and eat wings. Drink wings. Drink wings. I've always cross-trained. I like it. I mean, we play pickup basketball as cross-training, uh, disc golf. Anything that's just getting out and you're like moving rather than sitting, I count as cross training. What about now? Though? Like now you're healthy. Do you still incorporate cross training into your into your regime? Yeah, when, when Nike was open, I would swim. Um, that's about it. But if I was hurt, I would. I prefer like the elliptical or, or biking, like 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 real biking. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Moving on, we've got some sort of psychology type questions. Um, so here's a question specifically for Craig. I don't know if you've ever even experienced this, but Angel asks, have you ever felt that you wanted to give up running? If so, what did you do about it? <laughs> Angel. Um, yeah, about every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, uh, yeah, I, I've almost quit running a few times. When I was transferring from Mincy State, I was about to quit. Um, and luckily I had my high school coach who's very similar to your guys, high school coach. Um, and he convinced me just to transfer down to Ole Miss and give it a go for one semester. So I did. And, um, it worked out there. And then I've had a really bad professional season <clears throat> right when I first started and I thought about quitting and he convinced me again to just keep going. But there's always been someone in my, in my corner. And if it's meant to be, then there'll be someone in your corner where like you're, where, that'll convince you to um, keep running and stuff. That's well, that's my theory on life. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, next question is um, this is for Lauren, also from uh, is it Angel or Angel? But anyway, Angel. Same Angel. Um, Angel. Yes, Lauren. When somebody gets the feeling that they're going to lose a race before it starts, how can you change your mental state on the go? <laughs> wow. Um, well, I mean, honestly, the reality is like, no, no one's going to win every single race, but the, all you, what helps me when I feel like, you know, I've been in some races where that clearly like there have been some women that are way faster than me on paper. And I'm my, I might, I probably, I might not win that race, but you have to go in just not thinking about it so much as like about those other people and try not to compare yourself to where they're at but just think about like how, how well can I do on this day? Like what tools do I have? What can I improve on? And maybe that's not, you know, maybe it's not winning a race, but it's, I can finish faster than I've done. I can PR, I can finish higher in this type of race than I've ever done before. It's like finding those little ways to improve yourself versus like making it so much about like winning or other people because we all we all want to win races but I think there's so much more to the sport than just that and there's you can improve on something every time you 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 lace up your shoes so I would try to take the focus away from thinking about it so much as a comparison game versus like how can I have other people versus how can I better myself today um but, you know, like sometimes when those things pop up in your head right before a race, it can be really hard to shake. So I just try to think about um, just sticking to your routine and just um, just doing the best you can on that day. So this, this is a question for all of you. Like how many of you um, work with a sports psychologist in your in your group right now? You can start with you, Lauren. So you have a psychologist like on staff at NAZ Elite? Uh, I'm not my own psychologist. I was hoping not. <laughs> Sorry, uh, what'd you say? So is there a sports psychologist that you put directly that's kind of on staff or contracted uh, out? Sorry, no? it was cutting out. Um, yeah, so NAZ has, um, we use this um, sport performance complex called Hypo2 where there's, it's a team of sport performance specialists and one person on staff is a sports psychologist. So we do have like um, every Thursday we meet as a group and do focus sessions. And it's basically, it's just as like a topic and a lot of it's right now is focused on meditation and relaxation and um, lessening your anxiety because of what's happening globally right now. Um, 
but um, she's, her name is Shannon and she's available for private individual lessons as well. And uh, lessons or like sessions, but we have a guy on our team, Scott Fobble, who's like a really, really high level marathoner. And um, he's, he's been using her for a couple of years and really liked that. And um, I actually also worked with um, a private sports psychologist that we would Skype every week. Uh, he lived in Seattle. So you know, pretty far from Memphis, but I've worked with them in the past and I, I learned so much from every person that I work with because um, everyone has something new to offer and something that's relevant to you. So. How about you, Eric? Is there a um, psychologist on staff at uh, your track club? No, there's not one on staff, but I work with, uh, I work with one of my own from when I lived in Eugene. So I kind of like Craig was saying, um, I had also had like a multiple different like times where I was considering um, maybe moving on and stuff. And then one of them was, it was like the end of 2017, my contract with Hoka was ending and I was just like, I wasn't really happy with, with things. And so I started seeing a sports psychologist for the University of Oregon since I was in that town. And then um, I've just continued to work with her and she's been great. So we talk like, we connect probably every once every two weeks. And then she's also like on call. So before big races, um, we'll text and stuff like that. And so it's been, it's been massive because the last like two years, uh, we've, she's, yeah, she's helped me with a lot of stuff and on and off the track, I'd say. So. Yeah. How about you, Craig? Uh, yeah, we actually, so uh, we, like, oof, our whole group just separated. <laughs> uh, um, and, I, I never worked with this sports psychologist before because I, I didn't I had a bad feeling about him I didn't like him but now we work with a woman who lives in um, where is Rice is that in Texas yeah Houston yeah Houston yeah he lives in Houston yeah so so we just I just started working with her and I really like it um, she gets me I I work with her more as like uh like I she gets me like deeper thinking about like why. I make decisions in my life and stuff uh, with uh, related to running. So she is a sports psych, but I really like, I haven't gotten to use her on race day or anything yet, but I really like her. Okay. Bryce? Uh, I haven't ever worked with a sports psychologist. <laughs> I'm still kind of new to <clears throat> like all the new resources and stuff. So you know, I haven't had a chance to do anything like that. Is that something you'd be open to? Like even if things are going well? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it sounds, I always love connecting with people. So I don't know. I think it'd be cool to dive deeper on the thoughts of running, but I don't know. I'm pretty simple about it. <laughs> okay. Um, something to think about with sports psychologists is like, like Craig, you were saying you didn't get a good feeling from yours. Like, if you think about them just like another person on your team or like coaches, like you're not, it's kind of like you're not going to drive with every coach's training and like you need to find someone that works well with you because when you're talking about, you know, attitudes and your mental state it's very important to find somebody that you really connect with like and they're all going to be different so i just wanted to throw that in there <laughs> yeah 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 okay we're going to move on to talk about uh racing um and one of the questions is and i think some people will be surprised by this is, this is from sam tankersley actually let's let's do jake's jake's question first so jake ryan asks um what does a typical day look like leading up to a race so let's say you have a race that's at 8 p.m. Like, <clears throat> just rattle through hour by hour or like maybe every two hours. What are you guys doing, like from getting up in the morning to doing that race? Just rattle it off quickly. Start with Lauren. I'm gonna, if it's at 8 p.m., that's pretty late. So I'm gonna not set an alarm and make sure I get enough sleep. <laughs> And then um, I'll get up, get breakfast pretty quickly because I usually wake up like I, I want food or coffee right away and have my breakfast. And then I'll like just kind of relax. Like most of the day is focused on just like making sure I'm like relaxed and um, I don't like to do anything too like strenuous or taxing like I, I'm like, I like to have like trash TV on in my hotel room or whatever, or like the office or something, like something that's like kind of fun and not like super heavy. Um, and then I will do like a shakeout run typically early afternoon. So like it's usually 10 to 15 minutes 
very light jogging again, not worrying about pace. It's just to get your body moving. And then I'll take a nap or I'll, I'll have lunch. I'll, and usually with eating the day, the day of races, I stick with what I know works for me. And like, usually that might be kind of boring, like oatmeal or whatever, or like a plain sandwich or something. But um, yeah, I'm hydrating through the day. And then after I eat lunch, I'll take a nap and then it kind of starts over <laughs> where like I'm just kind of relaxing and then the night before my race I like to have the itinerary planned out as far as like when I'm going to leave for the track or something and um but yeah it's mostly just about trying to get myself like in a good head state and just kind of loose and relaxed and ready to kick ass later so typically like let's let's say the race is at 8 p.m um yeah. what would be the last time you would eat something uh i I like to eat like two and a half hours before the warm up or so. I don't have like a strict, like sometimes it's two hours, sometimes it's three, like, but something like that, I'll have a small meal and then I'll have, I'll bring like a granola bar or snack or something with me in case I get a little bit hungry. But yeah, like about, eh, yeah, about two hours or so before the, before the warm up. Is there anything, is there anything that you think you do before a race or on a race day? that's like a weird tradition or idiosyncrasy that you think probably nobody else does? Something that's unique to Lauren? I used to do that, but I stopped doing that. Like when I, my first season racing in Europe because things were so different. <laughs> I don't know. I think like if something gets thrown off that can mess with me mentally, but no, like I, I think my thing is like, I, like, I'm just one of those people with, with races. Like I kind of like to do my own thing. I, I, I kind of, I don't like to warm up with a bunch of people or something. I kind of like to just like focus on myself. So I usually have my headphones on. <laughs> so uh, I don't really have like any big routine like that. How about but, you, Eric? Um, I kind of do the same thing each time. Um, I kind of have like a six, four, two. It's kind of, it's like how I break it down so six hours before roughly sometimes it's seven hours before i'll go for a shakeout so i'll jog like you know 10 15 minutes and I, last year i got into the habit of doing it on the treadmill and i love it i don't know why just because i can just be kind of alone for the shakeout um and it's just easy i'll like set the sign up or whatever and i'll listen to whatever i'm listening to um yeah so i'll do that and then four hours before around four hours i'll eat and then two hours before is usually when I like have a cup of coffee, put my legs up and I'll head over to the track. Usually that's like the time I head to the track. And then um, usually right when I wrap the track, I, I started last year doing like meditation. So I put my feet back up before my coach, the physio will, you know, start to like open up your hips, do some sort of like mobilization and then just hang out until an hour before the race. But Ironically, unlike what Lauren said, um, I actually, I don't know if Craig is like this, but when I want to races, like I love warming up with other guys just for like banter, just for to keep loose. And a lot of times, um, yeah, I don't know. Some people don't like it because they get really, really quiet and really zoned, but I'm usually on the warm up. I'm usually pretty chatty and kind of talk about this match just because it's, it's fun. But then right when we get on the track, I'll, I'll like switch off and talk to them after the race. But that's anything unique. weird anything like unique to eric that you do like prior to a race anything unique to me yeah anything you think that nobody else does like like you know you wear like the same socks or something strange oh the speed suit became a thing in memphis a couple yeah. years ago <laughs> um it was just kind of for fun i was like oh man screw it i'm gonna have fun i want a speed suit and i worked out in it once and then i brought it to memphis uh, what was that 2018? Two, two years ago. I think you won that year. Yeah. yeah. That was the first time I wore it. And then afterwards, I was like, well, shoot, I'm going to have to wear this again. And then um, I wore it a couple more times that, that summer. And then indoors the next year, it was like 2019. I remember we went to, to the Northeast to like Boston, New York for three years. And I forgot to pack my singlet, but I packed my speed suit. And so. <laughs> My coach was like, you did that on purpose. I was like, no, I didn't. So I had to wear the suit every race. And after that, I was like, all right, well, I guess this is just how it's going to go. And this is so ironically right now, I mean, it doesn't matter because we're not losing right now, but I I have like 12 pairs of Adidas speed suits. <laughs> and I have zero singlet. Like Adidas didn't do much singlet. Hey, and yeah. so you can raffle off one of those speed you don't yeah, that. I told them that. I was like, I joked about that to my coach. I'm like, man, I might give some of these away because I have 12 pairs. They sent me so many. 
It might like, be hey, hey we'll do an MYA <laughs> raffle for that. You just wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they yeah, because they sent them too big and then they sent another shipment and that actually is smaller, so they fit me. But Terrence was saying, he's like, dude, don't raffle them off yet because they might actually ask for them back. And if you don't have it, they might charge you. <laughs> Each one's like, we, the, the price tag is crazy. But anyway, there's something here. How about you, Craig? Do you prescribe to the 642 theory proposed by Eric? Uh, I think we all do something pretty similar. Yeah, I, like, I don't like to sleep um, closer than five hours before my race. So I'll nap all day, and then uh, at five hours, I'll wake up and then do whatever until the race. You, will you keep a, do it like a shakeout run, like 10, 15 minute run the day of a race? They have an evening um, race? I'll go anywhere from three minutes to 10 minutes. Just purely based on how you feel? Yeah, um, no, based on how close, like the closest food spot. I like to um, do my shakeout to like a subway or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I jog there, get my sandwich, and then walk back. <laughs> Anything like uniquely Craig that you do before a race? No. Um, I, I, I like Lauren's thing where you don't we I don't like getting in a routine because once um, once you go to college or start going to bigger races your routine gets changed up because you can't get something or so uh, your warm-up that has to be an hour 30 out so I don't like doing um, I don't like having routines I like just doing whatever works for that race yeah Bryce? uh <clears throat> I kind of just go how the day unfolds I think the only real thing that I have is like I'll make sure to wake up, get a big breakfast in, and then I'll always do like a post-breakfast nap. And that's probably like all the sleep that I have for the day. And then, I don't know, just kind of like go get some lunch with my family and try to just walk around, keep the mind off the race for most of the day. Uh, try to get to the track like maybe like two hours before and just kind of get in the mindset then and start warming up and everything. But yeah, no, I just kind of go with it. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about like the um... – the postponement of the Olympics and the, the, the lack of racing opportunities uh, that we now have because of the virus. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you, like, how do you feel about the postponement of the 2020 Olympic Games? Start with Lauren. Um, I think I've kind of gone through the emotional yeah. game with it, but I think, like, I think this question is going to be answered differently by different athletes depending on like how they're feeling about their fitness or like maybe they've been hurt or whatever, like kind of where they are. But like, I, I'm kind of like, I am, I was, I am sad about it. It's like fresh, you know, like the whole situation is like just frustrating with everything going on. Um, but I personally, like I'm trying to, I'm choosing to see, the postponement more as a gift personally, because, um, like I feel really good about where my fitness is right now, but I changed a bunch of variables like altitude and everything, which is what I wanted. Like, I'm really happy I joined in AZ and this is where I want to be. But I think for me at the same time, because I came in to altitude hurt and like, um, I'm kind of choosing to see it as like just a good opportunity to get like even fitter and like be in a better spot when we do get to race or when the trials come around. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm not going to lie. Like we're, I, we're still training. We're doing a lot of base stuff. My workouts are long and like, I like to race. So like, I'd rather be racing than like just training. Um, so I'm, I'm okay with it being postponed for what, how, like, it would be completely irresponsible, I feel, to have it as is because of the state of the world and not having even opportunities to race and really leading up to it. But, um, yeah, I kind of have mixed feelings about it, but I, I've, I've come to terms with it. Like, I, I'm at peace with the decision. I think it's probably fair to say that, like, you know, everybody kind of saw this coming anyway, so everybody's kind of going to provide pretty much the same answer. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and ask each of you, and you, you sort of touched on this a little bit, but let's ask the guys now. Yeah. How is your training different because you don't know when you're racing next? So what have you changed? Eric? Everything. Um, yeah, we, nice. uh, yeah, completely into baseball. I actually took last week off. Um, so yeah, I completely reset everything. Um, it was, it's funny how much it shifted, you know, every week it was like, 
we were doing some pretty intense speed stuff thinking that we were going to race soon and then it just kind of all right we'll do some longer reps but like still hard and then it went to like okay we'll do a long tempo and then it went to like just run and then finally it was like, take a week off. and yeah. so um yeah but but it, like Lauren said I think it's okay I think it's fine if anything um I was injured last year for like the spring so I'm pretty happy to like now I get a whole year plus like more to uh, just string it together that helps me everyone's different but that helps me a lot so i'm pretty excited about it how about you craig uh yeah we um we went back to base training as well we're not stepping on a track we just do um everything on trails and stuff right now so you it's like training for cross country just kind of like <laughs> <laughs> so you're back to doing something that you might typically done in have done in like october november time frame is that fair to say yeah yeah and um for high schoolers it's a sim it's similar to like if if you guys don't get to time trial then it's like we're on the same boat we're, we're like everyone's training for cross country i guess or yeah so i so i i don't know i think we're pretty similar to to um to high school runners right now yeah. <laughs> no, I think we're I'm training gonna... for time trials or cross country right um What about you, Bryce? Uh, no, I'm like the exact same way. I think we all just kind of got pushed back into that strength phase. Uh, and have you taken some time off, or did you just like switch to base training? Just kind of switched like an off-season mode, I guess. Uh, not my favorite time of the year, but yeah, just I guess I got to build the strength anyway. Come to San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone come to Flagstaff. <laughs> oh, yeah, we were supposed to go to Flag, and then we can't. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, and then I'm assuming that, uh, do any of you have access, to, uh, we've touched on this a little bit, but just tell the people that are just, um, the kids that are on the call, um, who of you has access to a track still? So, well, Eric, uh, Eric, I actually still have access. Right, so you, so you still do kind of? Uh, I was until just like this week, I'll probably start transitioning to not using track anymore. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk to ask Lauren about this. So like Lauren, you moved to Flagstaff so that you could have training partners. And yeah. It's just irony yeah. By yourself. It, Speak yeah. To that it's, a, it's a little ironic because you know, I've, I've been in Memphis for the last six years or something. And, um, I love Memphis. Like, um, it's a great city. The people are great, but I moved, I decided to, I, I, I wanted to join a, a group with other professional women because I was just kind of craving that kind of shared camaraderie and just like having a team and someone to kind of like share the journey with in that way, like other, other women and who I could spar back and forth with and just have more of a team atmosphere for myself. So it does feel kind of ironic that like that was the main motivating <laughs> like factor behind joining a group. And now, um, you know, uh, our team, we're training completely by ourselves. Like we're not meeting up with anyone to run at all. Um, so that's been kind of tough, but I think one thing that's really been helping me or one way that I've had to think about it is like, this is not permanent. We, we won't be training solo forever. It's temporary, just like most things are. And so I'm kind of switching gears to, you know, it is an individual sport, but you, you, you are on the line by yourself, but at the, you know, like you, ha I, we, ha we all have teams behind us and that's, that's important. And so I think my job right now is to stay safe, stay healthy, do the best that I can just get as fit as I safely can so that when I'm back training with Danny or Steph or Alethine or any of my training partners, I can help them out. Like we can be of use to each other. And that's more motivating for me is like, I want to be fast and I want to beat people. But at the same time, like that's a cool thing about being on a team. It's like, it's not just about you. It's not only about me. Like I want to be able to contribute it to. And so that's been helpful for me. Um, you know, and then you guys like you, yeah, like it's, it's tough right now because you're not, training together with your teammates, but you're still on a team, like you're still teammates yeah. and you'll, you'll get to run with each other at some point. So just be ready 
ready for your teammates. So. Hey, fellow, this, is, this one's for the fellas. What is the, what do you say is the biggest thing you've learned about yourself um, during this sort of crisis and having to run by yourself? And like, what's the biggest thing you've learned about yourself, if anything? <laughs> um, that I actually am like pretty, pretty happy that to slow things down. I don't know. I don't know if that's like learning about myself, but like I'm, it feels like the last nine months for me have been very much on the go. And I feel like every month I'm living in a different house. And this is the time I think I've been, I just moved, but before that I moved as well. And so it's been, uh, it's been kind of nice to slow things down. And um, I don't know. Yeah. That's it, I guess. Greg? Um, I guess, yeah, you, you, Oh, this isn't about myself, but you learn what jobs are actually important. So when we're done running, I don't want to be in a pointless job that no one needs. And you can see kind of what jobs right now that people are doing that didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely provides perspective. Um, Bryce? I definitely just have too much energy to be sitting around the house. So I found myself kind of trying to do everything that I can to stay, stay active and not bored. A lot of, a lot of new activities. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. We're going to try and wrap this up uh, in the next sort of five minutes because we've gone over time. But um, so we've got some questions here. This is sort of under the category general slash fun stuff. So in 30 seconds or less, I want each of you to describe the race or the race that you're most proud of. Starting Lauren, go. I don't even know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe my Oxy 5K win like two years ago because like I felt like crap and I had to lead the whole race, but I still like I didn't give up and I ended up winning it and like got the standard that year. I don't know. Maybe that one. 15, 14? Is that where you ran your PB or? No, I actually ran like 15, 18 at that time. Y'all, I've run so many 15, 14 to 15, 19 races. It makes me sick. <laughs> so, but that was 15, yeah. 19 leading most of the way, right? Yeah. All right. Eric? Yeah. yeah. I'm like similar. I've run 336 like so many times. It's frustrating right now. Um, but probably last summer in Houston. Actually, yeah. Craig, you were in the A heat and I was in the B section. I don't know if Craig can hear me. But I remember um, I was initially in the D section of this meet, and I got bumped up to the B section, and they're going off, and I got around the rabbit, and then I, I ended up like yelling at the rabbit to like go, go faster, go faster, and then um, I went around them and kind of soloed, and they ended up combining the results, and so after the race, like right after my race was the A section, and Craig was in it with a bunch of studs. And I remember afterwards, I was like getting my bag and stuff and Craig came in and he's like, yo, you won, you, you won, you won the whole thing. And I was like, what? Was, yeah, yeah, like we ran like a half second slower than, than you. And, and I think I won by like three seconds because nobody went with the rabbit but me in my race. And then apparently I ended up winning the overall. But I remember Craig just came up and was like, yeah, yeah, dude, you, uh, you, you, won, the, you won the meet. <laughs> and I was like, oh, and then this guy comes over to me and just hands me some flowers and is like, go take a lap. And I was like, what? And I was like already getting my bag and leaving. And it was just really funny. But it was really cool because at that point, that was a huge, after that, I finally got invited to like some diamond leagues. And it was a big thing. Yeah. So. Great. Race you're most proud of? Um, probably the race where I got second to Bryce Hoffel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe like the Olympic trials when I was in college. Uh, it was crazy. But. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Bryce, surely Doha, right? Yeah, definitely that world championship final. I mean, it wasn't even one that I won, but like just getting to race with the three U.S. guys and Donovan and uh, hey. playing was, was a lot of fun. All right. Um, this question's for this question's from Trey Whitten. And this is the, you know, oh this. man. So Trey Whitten has got a question specifically for Lauren. And he says, Lauren, what was it like breaking your face? How did you bounce back? What was it <laughs> like? I'm going to show you guys a picture. I saw that one on the sheet. This, this is going to haunt you in your dreams, folks. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Lauren, tell us, tell us quickly. Like, well, I'll, I'll provide a little backstory. So Lauren ran um, 
Tyson Invitational at Arkansas her sophomore year. It was an 800 meters. And for some unknown reason, there were 16 women on the track. And it was basically demolition derby on the first turn. Lauren went down pretty hard. And I'll let her take the rest of the story. Oh, yeah. So, you know, like Tyson Invitational at Arkansas. It's like yeah. back banked and like I just sent them all a picture. <laughs> But um, yeah, like they <laughs> overloaded the race and, you know, with an 800, it's a bunch of elbows being thrown and everything. And like, it was just so many people on the track that like I got tripped from behind and I fell, but then I was fine and I tried to like get up, but a girl that was right behind me, like, so she didn't fall. she like tried to jump over me, but in the process, she like, her knee made contact with my face. So it like... Oh my God, my nose was broken, my cheekbone shattered, my, this is called your maxilla, it was broken, like my eye orbital socket was crushed, so my optic nerve was trapped, and I had to, like, I didn't finish the race, because like, I blacked out, and I just remember like, coming to maybe like 10 seconds later, and I had like, blood all over my jersey, it's pretty graphic, and then I crawled into the long jump pit because I had to get off the track because they were coming around again in the 800. And my trainer like picked me up and carried me off. And then I literally had like a panic attack because it was so just like, what is happening? You know? Um, but yeah, like I, so I had to drive home the eight hours from Arkansas to Waco in the bus with basically like a big frozen bag of peas and carrots on my face. <laughs> but then, uh, yeah, so, like, then I couldn't run for, like, a few weeks because with that kind of surgery with your fine muscles in your face, like, the swelling needs to go down so they can operate and not make mistakes. So, basically, like, I couldn't run for three weeks, and then two weeks later was national championship for indoors, and I had qualified. So, my coach had me, like, run easy for a few days, and then we did like speed work every day on the track like short stuff just to fire my muscles into moving again and then we ended up i, I got all american <laughs> Very amazing. is craig is craig still here there he is yeah so craig, he just, wanted to, he just wanted to go pee on here soon so um i think the question on everybody's lips is this is a part question first of all why did you cut off the mullet secondly uh, just hold on a second. Secondly, did you keep the actual hair that composed the mullet? Thirdly, Jesus. It impacted your love life. And <laughs> lastly, when can we expect to see another mullet? <laughs> we can't hear you. You're muted. Oh, you can't hear me. Oh, now we can. Is that all I am to you guys? A stupid haircut. <laughs> <laughs> it was your trademark. It was like a, it was um, a marketing dream. So why did you cut it off in the first place? So what caused <laughs> that? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I think I got it because maybe I didn't think I'd be able to go pro and I'm like, man, if I market myself well, <laughs> but I don't, I don't remember the exact, but I mean, it was just fun. It was, uh, I like being different. It was thousand dollars. <laughs> Did you keep the hair? No. Ew, please. <laughs> <laughs> Might we see another mullet? Yeah, I was growing one out, but um, now that the Olympics are canceled, I'll just cut it all off. Right. What about a porn stash? That um, maybe. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we'll see. It just goes by week by week, however I'm feeling. <laughs> oh man. All right. That, I think we're about out of time, and that's 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 all the questions I have that I've managed to work in. Um, if you guys could want to just like impart one more sort of pearl of wisdom, uh, to some of the runners on here about just, you know, maybe give them one golden tip to stay motivated, um, yeah. you know, amid this crisis until we find some races. Um, I guess I would say this is kind of cliche, but I think it's really important is like right now as most people are struggling with motivation, it's really important to remember your, your why. So like why you got into running, why you love it, like why what motivates you, why you still want to do it and just tap into, tap into that. So just trying to find your why in it and just 
yeah, keeping your motivation that way has been helpful for, for me. And right now it's less about results versus just enjoying it for the, for the sake of enjoying it too. So. Yeah. Hey Craig, I know you got to go in, in a minute. So like one pearl of wisdom for these, for these runners, like. Yeah, I, I say um, just make sure you're having fun with it. But um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's, it's really hard right now to be like, it, I like, I like you guys. It's, I like, I wish I had someone to talk to right now to like inspire me to run but the thing i remember most is that um for you guys is that most of the other people aren't really training uh like you guys have a great coach and a great team atmosphere and everything so uh, you guys are keeping it up and, and inspiring each other but there's a lot of people out there that aren't training that you're going to beat this fall or this spring or you know next time you guys get to race um and that's what's hopefully pushing me forward i hope that there's some pros out there that aren't training but after hearing this phone call it sounds like bryce and Eric are both training. <laughs> but just have fun. I don't know. Like it's it's just like a lot of people, um like a lot of people are getting out there and exercising right now just because they have more free time. But we we like we're out there doing it for for way more reasons than that. Like we could get to college or um, you know, run professionally. It's it's cool. It's a cool time where like if you, if you really care about running, you're going to be good at it. All right. Craig, we'll let you go. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, man. Thanks. Have a good run, Craig. Appreciate you, buddy. All right. Thank you guys. All right. Good luck. This season. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bryce, Eric, you got one pearl of wisdom. Uh, yeah, I'd say like, go ahead. Oh, are you going first? I'll go first. Uh, I'd say like, since it's a unique time, kind of just like, I mean, I'm sure we all love running, but, and just find the other things you have fun with in life and running isn't everything so i don't know i'd say kind of use it as a time to focus on that but also stay focused on like what you love i guess um but yeah eric um yeah just keep having fun and i think the idea of like having a team it keeps you accountable because obviously your coach is there no offense uh Nick, but it's kind of like a parent, you know, and they nag all the time. And it's just so sometimes it just goes from one year and out the other, and you're like, yeah, that's what you're supposed to say because you're my dad or you're my coach. <laughs> so sometimes like peer pressure goes farther. And I was even saying to Craig last time uh, we were on here last week talking, guys, um, Craig and I, we were like, well, you tag us on Instagram. Like we will mm -hmm. share that because like we're stoked to see you guys like out there. And, and like, hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, if you guys have an event this fall, I totally plan on coming back out and it'd be really cool to meet everybody as well. So um, whatever you guys, you know, helps, that helps me. I know I'm on Strava just to kind of keep in the loop with my friends, not so much for the uh, pace or whatever. It's not that. It's more just to keep kind of motivating your peers. So I'll, I'll get the guys to join the group on Strava. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm on there so it's it's fun it's just uh, it's like another platform kind of like instagram to me that's how i view it it's another way to stay in touch we talk smack to each other and and you know whatnot yeah all right well you guys got me pumped up to go run some old man miles so i'm gonna um <clears throat> wrap this up unless anybody else has any uh important advice or pearls of wisdom to impart i just uh, wanted to say hi to allison <laughs> <laughs> haven't seen you in a while and Lydia Nick I'll let you close us out yeah absolutely uh I really appreciate you taking the time out of y'all's day and your your training routines uh I know how important it is to to have your time and get ready for your runs and uh it, it's a it's a great opportunity to reach out and, and affect change from from your perspective and a lot of you all uh someone like Bryce isn't really too far out of all of this uh but we've got professionals at every end of the spectrum uh, some that are in the very beginning of their career, some in the middle, and some that are still rolling. Uh, and we're, 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 you know, we're just excited to have you guys on. And uh, if y'all need any uh, encouraging advice, I'm always open. So, you know, Craig already jumped off, but I'm, I'm always happy to, to be uh, in, in words of stripes. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to be your big toe if you need me to be. But, uh, guys, I hope y'all enjoyed it. Uh, I know the runners did. Uh, I look forward to seeing you guys at the Ed Murphy Classic and MCDC. Milner, thanks a, a million, man. This is a, a, a great uh, example of why you're better at this than I am. So 
all I can do is sit back and press buttons and, and yell at my boys uh, or in Eric's terms, apparently I'm just a parent. So <laughs> no, I appreciate you guys. See y'all soon. Love you. Right. Stay healthy. Cool. Thanks, Love everybody. you too. <laughs> all right. David, Dave, yeah. yeah. one more question for you. Um, what's worse? The potentially like Nashville Music City Distance Carnival not going through this year or Leeds United not being promoted because Ooh, it's wow. that's a tough one. I feel like this will happen at some point. <laughs> well, you don't know that. Oh, In case oh, oh. you guys don't know, David's a big Leeds, Leeds United fan. Yeah. And Le being a Leeds United, for that some context, being a Leeds United fan is sort of like dating Lindsay Lohan or Britney Spears. You, you're, you know, there are brief periods of beauty and pride, but mostly you're just ashamed and embarrassed. <laughs> year, yeah, you know, I went for a five second hundred the other day. <laughs> but this year, like Leeds are top of the league. You're going to top of the league right now. <laughs> it's taken a pandemic to prevent us from getting promoted. You and Liverpool, is uh, it? <laughs> All right, I had to ask you that. Cool, man. I forget, what's your team? Tottenham. Okay. It's, yeah, we're, we're just as frustrated. It's just as frustrating with Tottenham. Yeah. Do you play FIFA? It's literally on right now. <laughs> it's in, yeah. I was like, it's cool. kind of listening to that. Oh, it's the Xbox. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You need to play, you need to play against Thomas Staines. Thomas Staines? You know who Thomas is? I, okay. I know the name. But no. 800 meter runner, lives in Colorado. I mean, Bryce probably knows who he is. Yeah, Bryce could right. play him. Last time I played Bryce, Bryce kicked my butt. So. Thomas <laughs> I'm trying to get better at Bryce. I got to practice, man. That was embarrassing. <laughs> Thomas <laughs> plays FIFA at like a professional level. Like he went to like a tournament and it oh, was yeah. like podcast live and like he won. Oh, okay. I was, uh, who was he? I was Leeds and I made him play with like, I don't know what some crappy team was. And he still beat me 10 mil. It's my worst defeat ever. Really? Yeah. And I feel like he was going easy on me too. Our training camp in January, it was like me, Chris O'Hare, and Bryce, and one other guy. And we just, we would do our workouts, make lunch, play FIFA, we'd take a nap, play FIFA, make dinner, play FIFA. It was do, you, awesome. do you guys know James West? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's my roommate right now. Oh, so really? He, yeah, so he's been playing FIFA like all day. So y'all should find him and play him. <laughs> he just reached out to Terrence. Terrence was talking to me about him the other day. Yeah, he's, he's trying to figure out where he wants to go. He's like all in that process right now. Yeah. So, yeah. I guess we're on here. Everyone's muted. I don't know if these if you guys are all on here. Want to ask us questions? You unmute. I can unmute him real quick. Turn him real loose. quick. Sure, why not? Somebody else is on here, and you guys want to chat? Go for it, guys. I know Craig's gone, but Adam, Adam Willett, Lydia Tankersley. I know all you guys are. I see y'all still are on here. So if you want to ask questions, go for it. Parker Russ, Nick Verner. Where's Trey at? Trey's the one that likes to ask questions about people breaking their face. I think he's <laughs> Fix me up well. I think he's gone. They're all they're speechless. I'm I'll have to ask you guys how you made teenagers speechless. That's wonderful. <laughs> Van, nothing, nothing good. Will it? Barnett? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> all right. Carmel, you're the one that made a 36 ACT and going to Duke. You got anything intelligent? Uh, not this sir. I said you're the you're the brilliant one. What do what do you got for us? I think you muted him. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Eric. So I, I read somewhere that you you're pretty good on like um I think World Capitals. Did I read that somewhere? Like you know most of them. Is that right? Is it is it you that sort of touted your knowledge of like World Capitals? Oh yeah, don't grill me right now. <laughs> yeah, no, right now. but at some point we need to do yeah. that. We should. Oh, yeah. I remember talking to you about that, actually. Where did I see you last? We had this conversation. I can't remember, but like, yeah, I, I'd say I probably know about 75 to 80% of them. Damn. And now because I'm like obsessed with maps like that, so does my son knows, hey, he knows most of the capitals of the U.S. And awesome. I'd say probably like half the capitals of the world. That's so, cool. But we should combine forces for a pub trivia team. That would be awesome. We should do that one of the, uh, for like Nashville. So that's, that's one thing I, I had an idea from doing the Zoom thing. What if we did, the trivia. Uh, we selected like eight runners. Yeah. And we had like a trivia contest. 
I think that'd be fun. Yeah, that'd be really cool. I think it'd be fun. You maybe have to like write down your answer and hold the first person to hold it up in the absence of buzzers. Yeah, or you would need like a like if you were the host, we could open up like a. I don't know, like a way to message you our answers, kind of like how you you go drop off your answer. So one holding them up and writing them down on a bit of paper and holding them up would be pretty funny. Yeah, that's true. But I've thought about that. That's 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 one thing I would like to do. Just 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 amid this sort of COVID virus, and then um, I'm going to post the first one up probably on Monday. But I'm uh, overdubbing com uh, commentary on okay. races that have the benefit of drug test results. So the first one is going to be um, a video of, of the two. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Overdubbing. Yeah, that'd be yeah. hilarious. So the first one's going to be yeah, like 2008 up. Olympic final. Um, oh, and not even mention Asbel Kiprob or Ramsey. Like, they're not even mentioned. <laughs> and then that'd be so funny. Basically, call it like Nick Willis is winning the, the gold. Yeah. Hey, have you ever watched the <laughs> 2015 London Diamond League men's mile? I have to check that out. Why is that? Okay, go on YouTube. The okay. 2015 mile London Diamond League men's mile. It's okay. it's comical because so Asbel uh, is in it and just watch. It's okay. It's like one of the most obvious. This guy's taking something like it's interesting. <laughs> but so I watch it and laugh. And I'm like, this is a joke. How is this? A, it, it almost looks like The Incredibles, where that kid. They're like, slow down. No, no, go faster. No, no, no. no just slow down. Go by too much, and you can like see it. It's it's yeah. stupid. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to go for a run. Before okay. Again. All right, it's great. Eric, do you play trivia in San Diego a lot? With, like, All the time. Yeah, I love play? trivia. Sorry? The, this mission, Eric, this Golden State play? Yeah, yeah, we usually go on Tuesdays or Thursdays. Yeah, that's what we do too. <laughs> yeah, we started doing it in Manhattan team and stuff. But, hey, Nick, I wanted to ask you before I get off. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about did you see the news yesterday with World Athletics? They just suspended. Yeah. The, the, uh, yeah, okay, I was going to say that that has to, in some aspect, affect you guys because we wanted to come down and obviously try to do it at 1,500. Now it doesn't matter. It won't, won't count. For yeah, me. I – man, it's I – I just don't know where the decisions are coming from. It's just insane to me how they're – Laura, do you know what we're talking about, Lauren? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not – I'm not happy about that. <laughs> so yeah. the couple of guys that are on here, I don't, I don't know if you guys know what we're talking about, but essentially they suspended the qualification window for the Olympic Games. So all uh, standards, if you hit them in the next eight months, will not count, and they will not qualify again until December first. So, I mean, yeah. yeah. What is the uh, if they if they release the, if they release this from the restrictions and CDC says that's all good, which they're they're not, they'll they'll lighten the restrictions. I mean, what's the point? Why? I I feel like it's really premature and that like how can you decide on a date right now and I just feel like we're all kind of right now in this situation where motivation is going to be hard to come by and sustain and I felt like it was more demotivating like it just I feel like it added to the gloom yeah, a little bit. Sure. So, I mean the only thing that could be good is you know as of right now we still are going to have a U.S. champ this fall hopefully like that's yeah. what I heard. So, October, right? uh, yeah, something like that. First yeah. week of last week of September. Um, yeah. One of those, I'm not sure. But so I know, you know, there will be a qualification process for that. So, like, that would be indoors or um, maybe like Memphis, you right. can that, something like that. I know Adidas is going to still honor like the bonuses for mm -hmm. performances. And that's going to be the motivating factor for some of that. Others. Exactly. I was like, mm -hmm. well, that's nice because the IAAF or World Cup <laughs> doesn't, yeah. So. Um, I talked to Dave on the phone this morning and he was saying he was thinking about maybe for MCDC doing something like just trying to set up maybe records or just something like that. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, like something that has incentive. Still, I think momentum is really big. big. Like one of the things like Bryce and Craig, they're another office, but um, momentum is so big going into the Olympic year. And so one of the things that I remember thinking, and like Lauren, this pertains to you perfectly in a sense, if you're coming off a little hiccup, it's like, well, this is good. You just gained, you know, 18 months potentially to yeah. get momentum going. Yeah, I, I, like, I feel like even though I had that little niggle, like, I feel like I'm sitting on just like a huge fitness bank. And it's like, I'd like, you know, it's like, I'd like to be able to... <laughs> Yeah. the benefits of that in some way <laughs> yeah I get it. yeah I get it yeah yeah I mean yeah 
So, cool. yeah. Right. I'm going to get off. Thanks, yeah, guys. Yeah, great. <laughs> I appreciate it. We'll think of something good for you guys, I promise. Uh, EMC and MCDC are always going to be entertaining and fun to at least be oh, able yeah. to. So. Oh, yeah. EMC. Yeah. Sorry, I just <laughs> heard it called that. Okay. Yeah, cool. all right. Y'all be good. All right. Bye, Bye, guys. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Yes. Yeah. Appreciate you guys. Bye, Eric. Bye, Bye. Thank you. Bye.